Now, on the conservative side, as you know, a lot of flying theories going about anomalies, uh, episodic fraud. I mean, look at this dead guy who voted over here. Look at that guy who was stuffing ballots over there. But of course, the courts in these situations uh, use the principle that can be called the but for principle. But for the fraud, would the election have come out differently? And that's a pretty high bar. You have to show a magnitude of fraud. And that was I never felt was really done, never shown, never proven. And so, again, I thought, let's move on. This is something that we might never know. So it wasn't until I sat down with the, the two principles of the organization called True the Vote that I realized that they had sort of approached the election like a cold case, like cold case files. And they figured out, you know, there actually is a way to go back and and track the movements of these so-called mules. And there is a way also to look uh, through surveillance video and uh, in a sense, take us back to the days before and during the 2020 election to actually see what happened with your own two eyes. I'm Dave Rubin and joining me today is an author, podcast host, and creator of the new film, 2000 Mules, which is out right now. Dinesh D'Souza, welcome back to the Rubin Report. Dave, it's a real pleasure. Thanks for having me back. I'm looking forward to it. It's been a couple years since we've chatted on camera, my friend, but I feel that we have to give a warning right up top here. There is a good chance that my channel will be blown up on YouTube (laughs) because of this, but, I did create Locals. You launched 2,000 Mules on Locals, which I obviously want to get into, and I'm honored that you did that. And anything that we cannot put on YouTube for this interview, we will put up. Well, I'll just say it. We'll put it up on both our channels. Fair enough? I mean, Dave, what a surreal time we live in. I, I don't think you and I would have predicted a decade ago that we would find that these basic liberties, which are supposed to be outside the bounds of politics, free speech rights, for example, would somehow be abridged in this way and we'd have to watch what we say and figure out, should I put this up? I have exactly the same issue with my daily podcast. Um, And with this movie, you know, I couldn't put the trailer up on YouTube. I couldn't buy ads on Facebook. So I had to develop an entirely different business plan for releasing this movie as compared to any of my earlier ones. So let's get into that business plan in just a moment. But first, let's, let's focus on the movie itself. I was at the... I suppose it was the pre-premiere of the movie, which was at Mar-a-Lago, and it was sort of a a who's who of, uh, let's say, right-wing media or whatever you want to call all of us at this point. Uh, And I got to see the movie. I thought it was excellent. Many people on my book tour, one of the questions that I got more than anything else over the last couple weeks was, what did you think of the movie? And I recommended that everyone see it, make some judgments for themselves. What was the initial starting point of when you, did you want to immediately ask questions like the night of the election or was it a couple of weeks later? What, what was sort of the genesis of the whole idea? Well, like a lot of people, I, I noticed the anomalies of 2020 and they struck me as really strange. But once the curtain, well, once Biden was inaugurated and then of course a curtain of censorship descends on this topic, I thought, man, you know, we probably will never find out what really happened in the 2020 election. With each passing day, the event becomes more remote. And uh, and I was dissatisfied with the rhetoric a little bit on both sides. Now, you know, start with the left, the most secure election in history. And I thought to myself, even before I started anything with 2000 mules, well, how could you possibly know that? And they'd be like, well, Dinesh, where's your proof of fraud? And I'm like, well, let's say I had none. I have no proof. Does it make it the most secure election <laughs> of all time? I mean, right. these are still actual, separate things. Yeah. You haven't done an actual comparison of the amount of fraud in the last seven elections, for example, to show me that it was the least in 2020. And yet that became the mantra. Now, on the conservative side, as you know, a lot of flying theories going about anomalies, uh, episodic fraud. I mean, look at this dead guy who voted over here. Look at that guy who was stuffing ballots over there. But of course, the courts in these situations uh, use the principle that can be called the but for principle. But for the fraud, would the election have come out differently? And that's a pretty high bar. You have to show a magnitude of fraud. And that was, I never felt was really done, never shown, never proven. And so again, I thought, let's move on. This is something that we might never know. So it wasn't until I sat down with the, the two principles of the organization called True the Vote, that I realized that they had sort of approached the election like a cold case, like cold case files. And they figured out, you know, there actually is a way to go back and and track the movements of these so-called mules. 
And there is a way also to look uh, through surveillance video and uh, in a sense, take us back to the days before and during the 2020 election to actually see what happened with your own two eyes. Okay, so before we get into some of the specifics of how they use geotagging and how they were actually tracking these mules, and I want you to actually define what a mule is, which you do in the movie, obviously. How do you, as a filmmaker, because you've obviously made a bunch of documentaries before, how do you make sure that your own personal opinions don't override the truth? Because to me, that's gotta be the hardest part. I think there are moments in the movie where you sort of address that a little bit, but to remove all of your bias for all of us is almost completely impossible. It is impossible, and I would argue that in terms of attaining that kind of pure objectivity, that's never gonna happen. I mean, that doesn't occur uh, at all. But what you can do is try to have that sort of uh, empathetic ability, and, and it's a debating ability, by the way, to always see the strength of the counter argument of the other guy's point of view and import that into the film. Also, one of my techniques here was uh, I recognize that among the kind of Salem podcast hosts, I'm thinking of people like Eric Metaxas and Larry Elder, there were a mix of views about the election. Some of mm -hmm. them, it was stolen for sure. Some of them, nah, I haven't seen any proof of it. And I, I had the idea of importing them into the movie, uh, having their initial thoughts, then showing them the evidence and literally spontaneously filming their reaction and then asking them for their assessments. I thought in this way, it goes beyond just sort of Dinesh's singular interpretation and it becomes a conversation about the issue in which it's possible that somebody watching the movie would go, you know, I see stronger ground in what uh, Larry Elder is saying than anything Dinesh might have said. So by, by, by doing it that way, it does what a good movie does, which is it lays out a narrative with a range of positions and a range of potential uh, possible interpretations. It was interesting. So you use this round table of the Salem hosts. So it's, it's you and Dennis Prager and Larry Elder and Eric Metaxas and Charlie Kirk. Am I forgetting anyone? Uh, oh, and Seb I, Gorka. And Gorka, that's no, the gang. And you guys sort of spur, you know, you guys come and go throughout the movie discussing what's going on. And it's interesting because Dennis, I think, comes off as the most skeptical at the beginning. He kind of comes around a little bit more, but everyone's asking questions throughout. And obviously you didn't cut the questions. So uh, there, there's some credit there. I mean, in some ways, that's the best part where Dennis will say, for example, hey, listen, you know, you have a mule, you're showing this guy stuffing ballots. What if you run up to him right now and grab his ballots and look at them? What would you see on the ballot? I mean, what's cool about it to me is I thought to myself, those are the kinds of questions that people in the audience are going to be asking. So by putting them right in the movie, the movie doesn't have to come back and answer those questions because they are anticipated and addressed and at least discussed in the film itself. Okay, so for the people that have not seen it yet, without blowing anything major, can you at least, can you give the kind of elevator pitch on the, the methodology that you guys were looking at related to people's smartphones and where they were going and, and just the, the basic idea of what 2000 Mules is? Sure, the, the film, drawing on the work of this group called True the Vote, a kind of election intelligence group, if you will, uh, uses two independent modes of investigation or two, two modes of argument. The first one is cell phone geotracking. Uh, and that arises out of the simple point that we're at a stage of technology now, and perhaps also a stage where we have relinquished our privacy to a point now where our movements can be tracked. Uh, they're tracked because of not because of cell phone towers that are pinging. It's because of apps inside our phone that allow so-called aggregators to collect this data. And by the way, it's sold on the open market. Commercial companies can buy it. It's also very valuable to law enforcement, intelligence agencies. But essentially, if I was being geotracked right now, uh, you could tell for sure. I woke up in my bedroom, in my house. I then went to a coffee shop. Then I went to the studio to record my podcast. Then I had lunch with a friend at this restaurant. Then I came home. And all of that is shown, not by a single snapshot of my phone, but by what's called a pattern of life. You're showing the movement of my cell phone. Now, obviously, if I gave my cell phone to my wife, Debbie, it would show her movements. But that the cell phone is making these movements and going to these locations is really not open to doubt. And so what True the Vote did is they used the cell phone geotracking, used in many other areas, their kind of genius idea was let's apply that to ballot trafficking. And what we're looking for are these mules. Now, what's a mule? Basically a paid operative who is handed ballots uh, and asked to drop them off, to deliver them to uh, mail and drop boxes. And, uh, and we've been able to identify based on a, a criterion, actually a very high criterion, mules going to 10 or more drop boxes some 2,000 mules, and that's where the title of the movie comes from. 
If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.